Welcome to the Row by Row, the best dead gum gardening show on the radio and internet. Welcome, glad you're here. We got a special guest this evening, uh, somebody that we've worked with for a long, long time, Mr. Wendell Flowers. Wendell, glad to have you. Hey, good to be here, Greg. Yeah, Wendell is a, uh, a Monterey rep that has been around for a while. I don't mean that in a bad way. We, we <laughs> both got a little gray on us That's right, there you go. But uh, Wendell has been around for a while, been in the industry, and uh, has just been a great rep. He is our rep for Monterey, which is all, I say all, 98% of our pest control products. So he is a wealth of information that we lean to all the time. And we thought, what a better thing than have Wendell on the show, and let's talk about some pest control products. So, Wendell, just tell everybody a little bit about uh, about your background. Now, you've been, you started out, which I always find interesting, with Bonnie Plant Company. I did. I did. I did start out with Bonnie back in uh, 1978. Worked with him for about, uh, till 1987, and I was actually delivering vegetable plants. I'm sure most everybody recognizes Bonnie because they're nationwide now. At the time, they were, we were just concentrated in the southeastern part of the country, and uh but worked with them for about nine years and then left there and went to work with Montgomery Seed and Supply, a lawn and garden distributor here in the southeast, and did that for about 25 years. And about 10 years ago, I left and went to work with Monterey Lawn and Garden Products out of Fresno, California, and we were a manufacturer of uh, lawn and garden uh, chemicals, insecticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and what have you. So if somebody in the southeastern United States has bought a pest control product uh, from a mom and pop or a hollow hardware store, feed and sea store, you have probably had something to do with had, it. Somewhere. Had a little something yeah, to do with yeah, it. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Just a little bit. Okay, good deal. I want to talk about stock updates a little bit to everybody. Um, and you can address this with me as well. We're still having some major issues with transportation getting product in here. As we speak, we got two containers that are having issues getting here. We are having other problems with LTL freight products coming in, I'm talking about in the United States, getting hung up. Somehow or another, our transportation in this country is just a mess right now. Not only that, but the products, I mean, getting getting things like polymers, just getting anything is hard to get. Labor shortages, it is a tough time to be in business and to get products. Now, seeds didn't seem to be as affected as most of the hard goods, but I'll let you address a little bit on some of the challenges that y'all are having as well. Well, the same same challenges. Uh, you know, of course, everybody really knows what caused all this to start was COVID, and uh, it's created a lot of problems. We don't understand really what all's going on with it because we don't mm-hmm. know if it's uh, you know if it's because the factories shut down on manufacturing or they just couldn't get the help in to to do the manufacturing. But the shortages are just I think they're undoubtedly worldwide, and uh, it's from everything you know, from top to bottom. I mean, we have problems getting containers to put product in. We have problems with spray nozzles. We have problems getting the caps to go on the bottles. And we even have a little bit of issue, just like you're saying, uh, getting things into the port. Some of the things that come from from other parts of the world on some of these actives, you you get them to the port and it may take you a month to six weeks, to eight weeks to get them from the port to your manufacturing facility. So it's, we're having those problems, but we hope that things will eventually get better. We do. You and I actually sat down back in the fall of the year. I think it might have been November or December and went over some of our strategies and putting orders in. If we hadn't done that, then we wouldn't be, and we're not in great shape, but we wouldn't be in as good a shape with our inventory as we are now. That is correct. That is correct. So we're thankful for that. We are. All right, so we'll move on to a couple of things. We got our product highlight of the week, and I wanted to show y'all a couple of things. Today is Earth Day if you didn't know, and uh, a lot of people on Earth Day will plant a tree. That's kind of the common thing is to plant a tree. But uh, I said, you know, if you can't plant a tree, what about doing something else? So I want to show people this right here. We got a wildflower mix, and I actually planted one of these last year, and I'm going to show everybody here what it looks like here. I think I planted about a 1,000 square feet, and as you can see here, it turned out pretty dead to go nice. Now, normally, you're supposed to plant these in full sun. I did not have the area to plant in full sun. So what I did was plant it in an area that was probably 70% sun, 30% shade under some pine trees. And as you can see here, it has done pretty well. I have not done much to it. I raked it up, planted my seed, raked the seeds in. I may have watered a couple of times. And it has done pretty good. So there you have it. Here's the flowers that actually come off of it. We picked these earlier today to show y'all. 
And these are just stray wildflowers. A little assortment there. But we have these wildflower mixes, and we have them for regions. So we have them for the southeast. We have them for the southwest, midwest, whatever region you're in. You're able to pick out a mix specifically for that region. We offer these in quarter pounds, half pounds, and one pounds. And I think the rate is one pound per 1,000 square feet. We got the, uh, the wildflower mix. We also have the beneficial insect wildflower mix also, which is real similar to that one. So there you have it, folks. You want to do something nice, do something that you feel good about and have you some flowers later on, plant you some of these mixes. They absolutely work wonderful. You need to plant them in the area that you can kind of let lay out there and that you're not going to use, but you also want that, that area to give back to you a little bit. You can do it with these mixes right here. And I got one more thing I have got to show here. So the girls in the office reminded me that Mother's Day is coming up. So they wanted to put together a little package here for people that wanted to buy a gift for Mother's Day. And I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. So I'm not going to be able to take credit for this. I'm going to have to give it to them. But they come up with this little package here, and I'll go over it with you real quick. And we have this on the site. We have the Herb Garden Collection there. We have a garden planter. And we have this nice little garden knife. We call it the cabbage knife, which is a made in USA uh, knife used to cut cabbage, collards, or whatever you need to in the garden. We also put in there a 3.5 pound bag of the organic fertilizer, which is great on vegetables or flowers, containers, or raised beds, whatever. It's a great product. And you can put all that, tote it in your little hall satchel. It has a nice little strap on there. This is like a cotton duck satchel. And what a pretty logo on it there, folks. Hoss tools. And you can uh, put that on your shoulder, tote it around. This is also made in USA. So for $59.99, you can get that nice little gift for your mother for Mother's Day, and I guarantee you she'll love it. How about that? Well, we're going to talk about bugs in the garden. And, you know, bugs are one of the, it's not the top. I think the top thing that people really struggle with is weeds. But I think number two, people that have the biggest problems is bugs eating their uh, bugs and disease. But we're going to talk about bugs today, bugs in the garden. Right. So we're going to address some of that. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Now, we're going we're gonna to say this right here. There's all kinds of bugs in the garden, and we can't eliminate all of them. We don't need to have that mindset that we're going to go out there and eliminate all bugs because we can't do that. Even if we could, we shouldn't. That's right. What we want to do is control. That's right. And uh, we want to control the, the, the bugs in the garden. We want to control them to what they call a threshold that's not causing any damage. It's okay if they're out there, but we need to keep bring that population down of those pests that are causing us problems that they're not causing collateral damage to our plants. So that's where we're at on that. And let's talk about the two different kind of bugs. Okay. We got chewing insects and we got mouth sucking insects. That's correct. Now, which ones do you think causes the most problems? And in your experience, can you talk just a minute about some of the ones you hear the most problems with in the garden? Well, the, the chewing insects by far, I think, are one of the worst ones. And, uh, and they're probably one of the most hard to control. And, uh, but that's the one that most people will see the effects from. And uh, you have some that will, you know, put, it'll chew around on the leaf surface and uh, chew it up pretty good and uh, leave a lot of chewing marks. And you have those that have the little holes in there. But... Uh, in the leaf surface, but uh, pretty much the chewing ones, I would say, but there are, are a lot of sucking insects too. And uh, we've got a couple of different products and uh, that you can use, and uh, it's just according to which way you want to go. If you want to go with something that's more natural and more organic, or if you want to kind of get to something that's a little bit stronger maybe, and yep. it's, uh, it's a, a conventional type. Now, um, we got good bugs and we got bad bugs. That's right. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a constant balance trying to take those bad bugs out and leave the good bugs because the little good bugs eat the bad bugs. So this is a this is a touchy yep. thing, and you have to kind of thread through here. And you want to be very responsible about the way you, you treat do. these insects, you do. so that you don't cause more damage than you're doing good. That's correct. So, all right, so let's talk about the chewing insects first. Let's talk about worms. Okay. Worms is, a, as you mentioned, is a, is a big one in the garden. Horn worms on tomatoes. Okay, you've got a couple of different products that we can talk about. Uh, and we want to bring this one here in, and we want to bring uh, this one here in. And these are two different two different ones that we can use. And uh, 
There was also, oops, there's one more. I want, I want to mention this one here. And the worms, the worm population has been being taken care of mostly by uh, an, an old formulation called BT. Mm-hmm. That's the one that most people have used for years and years. Some people know of it. As, yeah, I think as, we got one. Did we there. bring one? Yeah, yeah we, we did. I'm right sorry. Right, yep. right here. And then some people will know that BT as <laughs> it's Bacillus thuringiensis, is the chemical. I mean, it's Can you the, say the, that uh, one more active. time? Bacillus thuringiensis. <laughs> but anyway, it's BT. It's, it's more commonly known, but also it is known uh, as in a dust form as dipel dust. Yep. And there is a liquid form of a wettable powder of dipel, and it's used agriculturally and commercially. Been being used for years and years. It's probably one of the better products that's on the market to take care of worms and caterpillars. Mm-hmm. But in the last few years, another product came along, and it's just a, uh, I won't get into the technicality of it. I was told years ago that it was actually, they found it in an old rum factory on one of the islands. I don't know where I it was located at, but it was it was actually fermentation, and uh, they started tinkering with it, and they saw that it worked really good, and it is a biofungicide also, I mean, an insecticide. And uh, But the thing about it, it just broadens the spectrum that it takes care of. This garden insect spray is a product called Spinosad. And it will work on the, the worms and the caterpillars, but it also works on thrips and it also works on beetles real good. Mm-hmm. And boy, and it even will work on some boars. And it's got a great label on there for uh, for fire ants. It's got a fire ant label on the liquid too. Yep, there's a there's a couple of baits out there that actually use that as the active ingredient. That is there. that is correct. But that's one of the one of the better ones. BT is still a good product. We still sell a tremendous amount of it because it's well known. It's been being used for you know, for years and years. But this one here, I think I like a little bit better because this does not affect either, even the BT. Neither one of those are going to fit, affect your beneficial insects. It's only going to kill the worms and the caterpillars pretty now let's much. Let's talk about the, mode of action just a minute. This one has a unique mode of action where they have got to ingest it. That's correct. So that you have to correct. spread on the leaf and the worm or caterpillar actually and has to ingest that. Then it breaks up that cycle and they die. That's right. That stops them from eating. And uh, once it stops from eating, they eventually die. And the same thing with the spinosad. It works pretty much the same way. But both of those products are really good. And that way, a lot of people are really concerned about uh, about bees and butterflies and things mm-hmm. like that. That's a real safe one to use right there. It's a garden insect spray. But as any of them, especially with the spinosad, you want to spray late in the afternoon or early in the morning. That, that is correct. Yep. That is correct. Yep. Yep. That's when you most of your bees are less active and... Uh, you can uh, do a little bit better job with it at that time of the day. That is correct. So we're just going to touch on a few of the, the most popular problems people have. I'm, okay. We'd be here till tomorrow sometimes we touched on all that's, insects. That's right. That's but right. We're going to touch on some of the most popular ones. Uh, at this time of the year, a lot of people are having trouble with Colorado potato beetle. That's correct. Which is a little beetle that's similar to the Mr. Ladybug, but it's not quite. That's right. I actually found one on my potatoes yesterday afternoon. And it can be a tough one. I mean... Uh, it can defoli- defoliate a potato plant in a quickly, hurry. quickly. Yeah. That's correct. And uh, a lot of people in the past have used a product called Seven. Right. And I will be honest with you, Seven works wonderful on these beetles. The problem with Seven is it is rough on bees. That's correct. It is probably the roughest product out there on bees. Yep. So although it does work great, it is if you're concerned about your bee population, <clears throat> don't use Seven. That's right. So let's talk about some some options on using a pesticides on the potatoes for Colorado potato beetle. Well, again, that garden insect spray there is labeled for Colorado potato beetle. Now, this beetles. is not going to work for that. No, this will not. That, yep, will, yeah, that, that, that will not. We'll put that over there. But the, the garden insect spray is definitely one of the better ones on the market. Anything that you, pretty much any insecticide or most of the insecticides you buy that do have Colorado potatoes, uh, Colorado potato beetles on the label, it's going to have the spinosad in it. Really? It is. It is. If you look at it, the active ingredient is pretty much the same. Yeah. But this one here is a half percent uh, spinosad, and it works really good on Colorado potato beans. And Do you remember off the top of your head what the uh, harvest interval or re-entry interval is on that? Probably a day, would you say? It, yes. You can actually use that today and harvest tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. There's no most of, most of our green label, and that's something else we didn't talk about, but all of our, in our particular line, in the Monterey Lawn and Garden line, the green labels are going to be our organic and our natural products, and all of our orange color labels are going to be our synthetic products. But that is one, and most of those green labels are natural, pretty natural products, and you can use them right up to day of harvest. Yeah. So they ingest this. The beetle ingests this. That and is it, correct. It, it kills them, okay. Yep. That's this, uh, what about cucumber beetles? That will also work on cucumber beetles. Garden insect spray is great on most most all of the varieties of beetles that are in that are in. What the about world. neem and uh, pyrethrin on some of these beetles? 
it will work. The pyrethrins, of course, is an all-natural pyrethrins that's in there. And uh, But the thing about the pyrethrins is it's a quick knockdown. It'll, it'll kill an insect really quick, but it just doesn't have a lot of residual like the spinosad will have. Spinosad is going to give you a residual of a couple of weeks where uh, for some of the products out there, like the neem, is, and it will probably give you somewhat of a residual, but pyrethrins, it's just going to pretty much kill what it comes in contact so with. So when I spray this on the plant, that's going to lay on that plant leaf for two, up to two weeks when that insect can ingest it. That is correct. Okay. Unless you, you know, if you have a lot of rain or you're watering, you know, more frequently or whatever you, and you get a lot of wash off, you may want to spray it a little bit more often than that, maybe okay. every seven to 10 days. Okay. Now this is ingestible. Our neem and our pyrethrin, I, I think neem may be a little bit go both ways. Both of those are going to be contact. That's correct. But that now neem correct. can be ingested, can it or not? It can, but it, it's not going to be that effective okay. being ingested. It's mainly a contact. Okay. It's going to be contact. Okay. Now the, the cucumber beetle, has, is, if you're not aware, is an adult beetle that has those small ragged holes in the leaves, if you've ever seen those. And it also transmits bacteria will. So a lot of these insects have twofold. Not only do they eat your plants, they transmit diseases. That's as correct. As uh, the cucumber beetle does. So it's important to control those flea beetles. Right. A lot of people have got flea beetles may not know what they look like. Looks like, your plant looks like it was shot with bird shot. It's got these yep. tiny little That's bitty right. holes all in the leaves. That's more likely as flea beetles and flea beetles are a small little baby. They are. Kind of remind you of a dog flea or whatever. I think they may be a little smaller than that, but it's really right. hard to see with the eye. Right. What do you think about controlling those? Well, now, one of the better, you, you mentioned the name and uh, I really, oops. I really think that that's what I would suggest on that one because that one actually has some insecticidal properties, some fungicide properties, and or some disease properties, and also uh, and also some uh, uh, other properties that will kill kill mites. But that neem oil is probably going to be the better one to use because, like you said, they not only eat and tear up your plant, they also transmit diseases, and that's going to that's gonna help take care of some of those fungus. Now, it does that in. by actually coating the plant, putting a protecting coat that, over that leaves so that that disease can enter the plant, right? That's correct. Okay. That is correct. That is correct. And it's one of the few things that also works on mites as well as insects. That's correct. It does work on mites also. And I, I might have got a little confusing a while ago when we talked about, when I said something about pyrethrins, the Fruit Tree Spray Plus actually has the neem oil, the 70% neem oil, and it does have... Uh, and we'll get one. Oops, get one of those, and it actually does uh, have pyrethrins in it. This one is just only has the uh, neem in it. It's a little stronger concentration than this. That is. that is correct. That has what a synergistic effect. That's a big right. word for me. Synergistic <laughs> effect. So a lot of times when you take these two compounds and you mix right. them together, you'll get benefits from it that you wouldn't or you wouldn't ordinarily get by themselves. That's right. That's exactly right. That's right. Now, I've never understood why y'all call this the Fruit Tree Spray Plus, because it works great on vegetables. It does. It has a vegetable label. It has a, uh, a flower label uh, for for uh, bedding plants. It has a label pretty much for everything. But the reason we do that is to not have so many different... We had so many people that wanted something specifically for fruit trees, so we label it that way, but we put plus on there so you can actually use it. You know, you'll read the label, you can use it on other things. But okay. it does work does work really good. And that does have the pyrethrins in there for that quick knockdown and then the, the uh, neem oil in there for the re, the residual part of it. Okay, let's talk about sucking insects. And those are the ones that's got the mouth part that actually pierces into the plant and it will pull the fluid or the juices out of the plant and it will also transmit diseases because a lot of times they're contaminated and they will from one plant to the next and they will introduce diseases as well. That's correct. And the probably the biggest one we battle and hear people having trouble with is squash bugs. Yep. Well, we have, you can use these again if you want to go with something that's more natural and more organic. You're just going to have to use a little bit more often. Those are our natural products. But then the other product we have is called Bug Buster 2. This is a fourth generation pyrethroid, which just kind of is on down the line a little piece. It's been modified a little bit and tinkered with, and it's not a natural product by no means, but it's pretty close to it. It's not. Not a lot of, uh, it has a good residual on it, but it's not a lot of withdrawal days uh, from it. No no more, well, really just a little bit more than what it is on the organics. But anyway, for those chewing and uh, those sucking insects, the good thing about that is a product called Espenvalorate. It's uh, being used uh, on the commercial side and the ag side uh, in a stronger formulation of the same product, but it works really good on your hard-bodied insects, your soft-bodied insects, and it also works on worms and caterpillars. So it's just, it's a, it is a synthetic, but... Uh, Works really good. I mean, just to give you a good example, withdrawal day on tomatoes is like one day. 
uh, on squash. It's like three days, but it works really good on squash bugs. It was, works good on uh, on uh, any of your, your, your stinging type like your... Uh, and if your worms get ahead of you, you can also use this on your worms. That's exactly right. That is correct. Stink bugs is another big problem. Stink that's a up. big problem on peas and beans. I was trying to think of that, and I just couldn't think of it. But stink bugs, and there's not a lot of insecticides on the market for homeowners no, to use. No, what about that southern pea curio? That's it. That's the only one That's the only one I know for a homeowner to use right there on that cow pea curio. Yeah. So if you want to go organically, or not necessarily organic, but you want a good insecticide spray program, you can use these two right here early on. That's correct. And once your populations get ahead of you, may get out of control, then you want to switch over to the Bug Buster 2. Not organic, but it's going to give you those last resort options out there so that you can go in there and clean your garden up. If you can get by with some of these natural controls, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, this also that's gives right. you an option if they do get out of control on you. And squash bugs, stink bugs, if you get them early on, you can break that cycle with these. That's right. But if they get ahead of you, you're you done. Yeah, yeah you're you done. You're going to have to go it. to a, a more conventional type product. Right. That's correct. Yep. That is correct. All right, uh, aphids. Now, aphids is probably one of the most popular insects people see on plants and stuff. Right. And probably the easiest to control. It is. It is. Uh, I did want to show you this product because this does have, now all, all of these products right here will work on aphids too. And I mean, I know that may get a little confusing, but we don't want to do that. But this is, a few years ago, uh, we always had a product, and some of the, some of your viewers may uh, remember the old dormant oil spray. Mm -hmm. Most of them were petroleum based, right. and you could only use them during the dormant season. You couldn't use them in the heat of the summer and in the spring when, it, when the temperatures got hot. Now they have actually, we have come up with one that is actually a, a horticultural oil spray. And you can use this one totally year round with no heat restrictions at all. Even during the hot part e of the day? Even, listen. Really? I didn't know you that. Can, you can use it at 110 degrees and it won't burn. Well, that's a new we one don't one. recommend that you get out there in the middle of the day now when yep. the sun's shining down. But it does work really good and it don't burn the leaf surface of the plants. And uh, people choose those oil sprays because those right there actually work good on aphids because it actually suffocates those soft-bodied insects. And it's got a pretty decent, you know, it's got a little bit of a residual with it, but uh, it's just a more natural way to take care of it without spraying any of your, you know. Yeah, I guess I was thinking old school. I've been telling people not to spray it during the heat of the day because we normally just don't recommend that. Well, years ago, we couldn't. We couldn't. At, petro at yeah. petroleum base, it would burn that plant. And and they, recommend, they recommend at 90 degrees, shut it off yeah, and don't I've use it. it yeah. But you can but you can use that one totally year round. And we have never had, since I've been with the company for 10 years, I've never heard of anybody burning anything with it. So You know, that's another good one too to use on your fruit trees and things like that before they bud out. You can actually spray the bark yeah. of the tree and it'll kill those scale crawlers. That's exactly so right. So that's a good one you know, to use for that. That's it. And we do have a, uh, I don't know if we brought one in here. We didn't, but we got another product that you normally you normally carry. Uh, it's called Liquid Cop. Yep. I know some, again, some of your viewers may remember a few years back, we had a product called Lime Sulfur Spray. That's what they used for that dormant cleanup on fruit trees. And that's what they did commercially and everything. You can't buy that Lime Sulfur Spray anymore. It, it was just, it had lime and it had, of course, had sulfur in there. But uh, people would love to use that for a cleanup for fun funguses and for overwintering funguses and overwintering insect. So what we did is we tested doing the horticultural oil mixed with the liquid cop. And it does a great job to do the same thing that the old lime sulfur did. Really? And you just mix one ounce of each of those in a gallon of water and you can spray that tree in the dormant season just like you did with the lime sulfur spray. Hmm. So that's something for your old timers. Yeah, good that, information that, you know, there. I learned know. something today myself. All right, so let's, uh, aphids, one more thing on aphids before we move off that. If you, uh, if you see ants in your garden crawling up a stem to a plant, more than likely, I bet you got an aphid problem. That's right. That's a dead yeah. giveaway there. Everybody talks about ants in the garden. The reason you got ants in your garden is because you got aphids. If you control the aphids, the ants, they won't cause any damage and they'll pretty much go away. So I always check the underside of those leaves when you see those ants, and I bet you you're going to see some aphids there. And what those ants are doing, they're guarding those aphids because that's, that's right. a food source. That's right. All right, uh, thrips. Now, thrips is a tough one in my neck of the woods, and they control, I'm going to control, they move a lot of uh, diseases around too. And uh, they're very mobile. So what do you recommend on thrips? And we go back to the green bottle. Going back to the green bottle, going back to that garden insect spray. It works, it's, it's a spinosad and it works good on thrips also. Thrips, beetles, boars, and a lot of your worms and your caterpillars. Okay. So that's probably one of the better ones. What about the uh, Bug Buster 2? Would it also work on thrips? It, it, it does. Okay, it if does. somebody was not concerned about the organic, 
Yep. Uh, they could go with that one. They could go with that one. That's yep. correct. That is and correct. that's going to get all your soft body insects. That's correct. <clears throat> Pretty much it doesn't list every one, but it lists well over 200 insects. And it's it's got, what amazes me with it is it's just one of those that's so much better than some of the other conventionals because it does kill the hard-bodied insects and the soft-bodied ones and the worms and caterpillars. Yeah, a cure-all. A cure, pretty much a cure-all. It's not now, snake oil, but right. it's, it's a cure-all. Yeah, I would not <laughs> recommend it uh, as, as an early-on product that you can get by with something <clears throat> less, um, what's the word I'm looking for there? If you could get by with something less, like some of the names, some of the spinosads and all natural, that. more natural, more organic. I think they're going yes. to be a little they're going to be a lot softer on your beneficials than this would be. So I would start off with those. And there again, when you move into those high populations or when you're getting some damage, you just can't stand anymore. Yes, that's right. Then you can turn then you this switch right And like the old say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, that's one thing. Let's talk about on the on the organic versus the synthetic. These synthetics are, are they're there for cures. That's pretty right. Pretty much. That's, for, that's right. But when you're, when you're looking at doing an organic program, you got to think preactive instead that's, of that proactive. That's correct. That's correct. And I always tell people, I said, you got to stock up on these products ahead of time because when you go out there on Saturday and you, and you notice you got a problem, you should have already been spraying or you need to start immediately. That's correct. So you got to keep, you got to anticipate that you're going to have a problem because if you're growing vegetables in the vegetable garden, at some point in time, you're going to have an outbreak that you need to control. That's right. That's exactly right. White flies. Now, white flies, we get around here about every second year. We get a terrible infestation of them late in the summer. And that's one of the reasons I, I quit growing some of my winter squashes late. But right. and pumpkins, too, is because of white, white flies. flies. They're easy to kill. They are. They are very easy. And again, we can go back all through some of those we just talked about. Uh, the the spinosad, I wouldn't recommend, but definitely the, the neem oil. <clears throat> the fruit tree spray plus is a good one. Uh, again, that hoard oil, that horticultural oil is... is, is I don't want to say it's non it's non invasive. It's not non invasive, but it's just not. You're using a real natural organic way of controlling them, and that right there will suffocate those uh, suffocate them really really easy. They're easy to kill. They easy to kill. Very the easy problem kill. is they said they get mobile. That's it. They can fly around. It's they hard are. to get them. That's the reason you always want to treat white flies early in the morning or right. late in the afternoon, so they're not as active. That's they don't right. fly around as much, and you can get as much. Bam, as you can when you spray them. And make sure when you spray and you always, if you spray in a product like the hoard oil, you spray on the top of the leaf surface and underneath. Make sure you catch it all because there are just as many underneath there or more, they are, or more yeah. as, than they are on top of the leaf surface. Another thing too, folks, is when you get to what we call the point of runoff, when you see that droplet dripping off that leaf, you've done that's, your job. That's when you can quit. That's, you quit, that's you can correct. move on. That's, that's right. the term, terminology that everybody in the industry uses, point of runoff. When you see it right. dripping off, Right. Quit spraying, go to the next one. But you want us really coverage is so important yeah. with these products, uh, especially the organic products, getting them underneath that leaf. That's, that's right. where the majority of the insects live at. That's right. All right, so I think we have covered most of them. Now, we've got a couple of new products here that are fungicides. I want you to talk about a minute that we just got in. And one of them is the, Mon the Gar Monterey Garden Foss. Garden Foss. Garden Foss. Tell us about that one. Very good product. Uh, we're one of the only companies that actually package one in a retail package for the homeowner to use it. It's being used, uh, heavily used in the uh, in the tomato industry, uh, uh, commercially and agriculturally. Uh, it's a product, uh, the active in it's called phosphorus acid. But it's a, na it's, a, it's a fairly natural fertilizer product. It's not natural. I, don't, I shouldn't say it's natural, because, but you can use this right up today. You know, you can put it on today and harvest tomorrow. There's not a withdrawal on it, but it's not totally organic, so we couldn't market it that way. But it's just a great product that you, if you've got a problem with blight on tomatoes, if you've got a problem with, uh, if you've got a oak tree in your yard that you, you see in some uh, signs of the uh, sudden oak death disease, that usually if you don't control it early, it's going to take that tree out. Uh, pythium in turf, phytophorus, uh, root rot on trees and shrubs, uh, just a good all-around drench. It does have a foliar application too. But for those people that's having blight problems with tomatoes, that's one of the better ones. Now, how would you market. apply this? Is the foliar is a drench? Mostly the drench. It's got okay. it's got two different it's got two different applications on there. But uh, the biggest uh, the biggest application is going to be for the drench. Well, mix some drench. up from the five gallon bucket and just pour it. You out can in. absolutely. You yeah. can. You can. You sure can. Or you can spray it. You know, if you want to put it on the foliar, you can put it on the foliar also, and then just let it really run off and let it drench down in. And early blight and late blight, both of them? Works on both of them. It does. Yes. It does. I always have a problem with early blight. Right. The that's either, right. That's just... Works really better on the late blight. Uh, we do have a product that does work better on the early blight, 
and uh, it's that complete disease control. Okay. So. Yeah. All right, and the next, let's see if we got one of those over yeah. there. The, the Fungimax. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a product, uh, not to bore everybody with what goes on in our industry, but just a few years ago, uh, we really marketed Daconil. Uh It had a great label on there. It had a good lawn label on there. Our uh, government decided they didn't want anybody to use that on lawn anymore. So we had to kind of downsize to one product we felt like would do everything that was a, uh, a good lawn and for fruit trees and for vegetables and fruits. And so we went with uh, Microbutanil, which is a good product. Ours is, is a 2% uh, formulation as opposed to most of them out there on the market that are 1%. But the good thing about this one here, it's very safe to use. It's a systemic. You can use it on vegetables. You can use it on fruits. You can use it on the lawn. It, it takes care. It, it actually is a curative and a preventative. You double up on it if you want to do it, want to do a curative application. But again, you know, we're talking about preventative maintenance. If you use that, if you know you've had some problems in your lawn or on some of your shrubbery, some of your trees, some of your vegetables with dampness and you're having problem with downy mildew and, and you know, different kinds of funguses. Is this one also works on rust? Is that the it does. That, this is good does. one on rust, got a, right? Got a good one rust on rust. Rust on beans and peas. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it can be used on everything. And uh, most applications is one ounce uh, to the gallon. Now, it, on turf, it's only going to cover about 1,500 square foot on the curative side. But uh, believe me, if you've ever had uh, dollar, dollar patch or dollar spot or pythium or, or phytophorus in, in lawns, I mean, that one is a good one right there. You, you want to you know, you spray it. Systemic as, action. It does have systemic action. So do, do you want to do, in the vegetable garden, would you want to do a drench and a foliar application each or or? Just do the foliar application. Okay, foliar yep, application. Because it'll be taken in through the leaf surface of the plant. Okay, the and plant. then moves throughout then it moves the plant. moves throughout the plant. Okay. That is correct. That is correct. And you can use that. I mean, there, it, you don't have a big withdrawal on that one either. I mean, even though it's in an orange color label, it is conventional, but you can use that up to pretty much up to the day of harvest. Hmm. So there's not a, not a big withdrawal on it at all. Yeah, good information there, Wendell. But that is, but that is a good one. <clears throat> and uh, that's going to be more for those people, like you said, that, that maybe did not do the neem. The neem oil is a great preventative. If you can get that out early in the season, you're going to eliminate a lot of those problems you're going to have down the road where you have to use a conventional type product. So. Let's talk about one more. Okay. DE. DE. I know right. this is not your product, but, it's you, not. <clears throat> but you know a lot about it. Been in the industry a long time. Athamaceous herb. This is what I drank on the show a couple weeks ago, <laughs> and this is a this is a great organic product. Oh, it is. It's mined. It's mined out west. Uh, they got actually got uh, natural mines out there where they where they really? dig that stuff up. So this right here, uh, this is the way I would use this, and I'll let you chime in on it. This being a dust, it's kind of hard to hold on a leaf sometimes. It is. And what happens is those insects crawl across this, and it has these little tiny sharp protrusions, I guess, from the uh, the little small poly particles in it, and it will actually puncture the exoskeleton of the insect, causing it to dry out and die. All that being said, it kills bugs. It the best way it does it is when they travel across it. So the way I would use this right here is at the base of the plant, kind of sprinkle it. This actually has a shaker can on it. Shake it around the base of the plant, and it kind of protects the plant there. I have a hard time getting it to hold on the leaf, the plant. It, it, it is hard to do. It's better to do it just like you said, and uh, and and it works better by putting it around the base of the plant. Extremely it safe. It is. Oh yes, it is. I mean, I drank the glass full of it. it. Don't taste real good. Well, you know, they you see there that's a food grade. Yep. They actually feed that to animals. Yep. To kill parasites. That's so right. it actually it it works great. It's a good product. It's been around a long time. Probably not enough education on it, right. uh, but the more people see it, the more people, especially people use it, yeah. they're going to like it more and more. Yeah. And for fire ants, I mean, it works great on yeah. ants. It works on anything that will, like you said, that will cross over. Roachy bugs, man, that, that stuff works really good, and it's very oh, yeah. safe to use. Yep, absolutely. Very safe to use. So if you're really concerned about being safe around pets and, and small kids, that is a great product out there. It is. All right, well, I think we covered a lot today, don't you? Well, we did. Hopefully, we didn't confuse anybody. <laughs> Hopefully, we helped some folks out there think about their garden, think about being right. successful in the garden and controlling some of these insects. Don't get don't get really frustrated because it's so easy to do. Yeah. Understand you got to have your plan. Have some of these products on hand. Understand the difference between a sucking insect, a mouth piercing insect. Understand how you control the different ones. And once you get that basic understanding down, I think you can make some good decisions on what product you need to use. Look here, don't let it be overwhelming to you. You don't have to be an entomologist. You don't have to have this nope. vast knowledge of what 
every insect is. But if you understand the basics of these right here, I think you can be successful in protecting your crop and growing your own food. And that's what that's we're right. all about. That's exactly right. That's it. All right, folks. Good deal. We're going to wrap this thing up. And uh, Wendell, it's great to have you. And I'd like to you one thing before we left. War Eagle or uh, Roll Tide? Roll Tide. <laughs> really? Yeah. Can't go wrong there, can you? Can't go wrong there. Yeah, Wendell is uh, from uh, down in what we call L.A., Lower Alabama. Exactly right. where are you from? I'm from Troy. Troy, okay. Troy, Alabama, yep. Most people are probably pretty familiar with that place. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the home of the Trojans. Yes, sir. There you go. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Get out there and get in that dark garden and get dirty. <laughs>